connect with mankind through your promises and miraculous deeds. And so, Lord, be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, 385,000 babies are born every day on earth. The majority of these births are without any complications, but sometimes there are births that call for divine intervention. Perhaps it's discovered that the baby is breech, and so prayers are sent up. Perhaps the mother's life is in danger, and so prayers are sent up. An extra dose of prayer went up for two of our children out of the four. Uh, Peter was born about four weeks early. Um, he went into be delivered, and they took him right from the delivery room into the ICU where he spent 12 days uh, where his lungs needed to develop. And Cassie was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around her neck, and so there was a panicked, prayerful few seconds there as they dealt with that situation. Now, thankfully, every turned, everything turned out fine, and they went on to live uh, healthy childhoods after this. But even as frightening as these births were for us, they would not be described as miraculous. We didn't try to conceive for years without success. We didn't have sex tuplets. We weren't visited by the angel of the Lord. And besides the general miracle of birth itself, these were basically your run-of-the-mill births. Jacob and Esau, Esau battled within their mother, Rachel, who was distraught over what was happening to her until the angel told her that two nations were struggling within her. Moses came close to being killed because of the edict of Pharaoh, was sent in a little raft down the river there, picked up by Pharaoh's daughter and adopted into the household. These were more miraculous types of births. And so we are in the Advent season, a season of waiting. And in fact, the word Advent means the arrival of a notable person. And so we're going to be looking over the next four weeks here at the arrival of some notable people and their births. And in each situation, we are going to ask the question, what was the miraculous aspect of their arrival? Why did they come? And what lessons can we learn for our lives today? And so today we are going to look at the life of Samson and his miraculous arrival. One of the common themes that we're going to see woven through these miraculous counts accounts over the next four weeks here, is that none of these births should have been possible. The first three fall into the category of barrenness, or the inability to have children because of some biological problem. Today we call it infertility. But down through the ages, infertile women have been viewed as deserts because of the uh, wasteland of their womb, no seed taking root there, but because of the rise of unemployment among women in modern times, especially in the West, infertility is not seen as negatively as other times in history. But the infer uh, infertile woman may face uh, and receive a litany of advice on how co to conceive. Have you tried in vitro? What about acupuncture? If you just relax, it'll happen. But generally speaking, this woman today will go on to live a fairly normal, productive life without much uh, stigma from society. But during biblical times, a barren woman experienced great shame and uh, depression many times. And so, to marry and bear children was the height of the feminine experience back then. And much of her worth was wrapped up in her ability to be able to do this. Carrying on one's family line was important, and a woman, if women could not accomplish this, then it was a great disgrace to her, and it could lead to marital problems and even problems within society. In fact, during some times in history, infertile women were suspected of witchery and many times burned at the stake. Manoah here, a man from the tribe of Dan, had a wife that was barren. But God selected these two for a miracle. There was nothing significant about either one of them as far as we can tell from the biblical account. There was no history of leadership, no notable faith, no exceptional righteousness. But this shows us that God's decision to pick somebody is not based on certain criteria. It's based on his decision. It's based on his sovereign will. And so the miracle begins, as many of them did, with a visit from an angel. 
And as often happens in these situations, the angel visits just the woman. I find some of these encounters with angels a bit humorous. The first thing that the angel says to her is, Behold, you are barren and have not born children. And I'm sure she's thinking, Oh, great. Not only am I a shame in my whole entire community here, but all of heaven knows about my situation as well. Thanks a lot. Then he goes on with some seemingly good news. But you will bear a son. Now I say seemingly here good news because I have a feeling that if she knew about all the pain and anguish that would accompany this blessing of a son, she may have taken a hard pass. You see, being the mother of Samson Samson turned out to be a very heartbreaking experience for many reasons that we're going to go into in a little bit here. And this teaches us that sometimes God's blessing takes us through the shadow of death. His blessings can even sometimes appear to be a curse. We're going to see here in this other three stories that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. For instance, Samuel's mother had to give him up as soon as he was weaned. John the Baptist's mother, if she were alive, we're not sure if she was at the time, would have had to watch her son be beheaded. And we all know the grief that Mary went through as she watched her son on the cross. But for the moment here, Manoah's wife is elated, and she runs to him with the great news. And as typical for men at the time, he didn't want to hear it from her, he wanted to hear it from the horse's mouth. And so he wanted a meeting with this angel as well. Well, God grants this second meeting, And during this subsequent meeting, some rules for growing kids God's way are laid out. No drinking, no funerals, no haircuts. And as a barber, I'm not sure about that last one. But they basically raised Samson as a non-partying hippie, a Nazarite. (laughs) We see the first biblical description of a Nazarite way back in Numbers chapter 6. And this word Nazarite means consecrated or set apart. And so the Nazarite vow was a vow that non-Levites would take in order to consecrate themselves unto the Lord. And these strict rules would be followed that were much stricter than the general laws that were laid down by God through Moses. But it was very unusual for a child to be a Nazarite because this vow was taken as an adult. And usually the Nazarite vow was only for a set period of time, a number of weeks, months, or even years. Paul the Apostle was probably taking a Nazarite vow in Acts chapter 18. And there's only one other person in the Bible recorded that was a Nazarite from birth. And we'll be looking at him in a couple of weeks, John the Baptist. But it seems as though Samson had some mixed feelings about this whole Nazarite vow from birth thing. Kind of reminds me of the minister kid who rebels against his father uh, and his teachings. And even this, though, the Lord used for his purposes, as we'll see as we address this next question. What was Samson's purpose? Now, although your life story might not be recorded in Scripture or any other media for that matter, God has specific purpose for you to fulfill. In fact, he fits your personality to the purpose, as is displayed beautifully here in this story of Samson. Now, for most of us, The plans that God has for our lives are cloaked in mystery. And it's not until we look back at the end of our life that many times we see that plan unfold. Sometimes we don't even know until we get to heaven what it was about. But for a select few, God reveals his plan even before they are born. Samson here is one such individual. The angel tells his mother, and he will begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Aha, those nasty Philistines. What was their problem anyways? I mean, they're always messing with Israel. Why couldn't they be like Canada, a nice place to visit, but not a real threat? Well, the history of the Philistines in Israel went back and forth for centuries before Samson. According to genealogical records, the Philistines had migrated to the Middle East from Europe by way of the island of Crete, which was about 100 miles south of uh, Greece. How they ended up in the vicinity of Israel is unknown, but at the uh, height of Israel's power, uh, the Philistines were their greatest rival, their gravest enemy. The Philistines had five major cities which were controlled by kings of those cities. 
And so these were fighting people. They were known as warriors. One Philistine that is very popular among culture today and that you've heard about, I'm sure, is the man Goliath. He was a great warrior. And they were continually battling against Israel, at one point even stealing the Ark of the Covenant from them. And so at the time of Samson's birth, Israel had been under the thumb of the Philistines for 40 years. Israel had done evil in the sight of the Lord, and now they were suffering for it. But God's desire was never to destroy them completely. He disciplined them for a time until they learned their lesson, and then they returned back to him through judges that would bring freedom to the people. And so Samson was destined to be one of these judges, one of these heroes, although he was a little reluctant about it. As Samson grew, Judges 13, 24 through 25 states that the Lord blessed him and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. Now, I want you to pay attention in the next little bit here because the way in which God stirred him was a little bit unusual, probably not the way that I would want any of my sons to be stirred by the Lord to action. One day, Samson goes down to the city of Timnah, which was a city of Philistia. And it was just a few miles from his town Zorah, just across the border, the Israelite-Philistine border there. And so it would be like a young man going from San Diego down to Tijuana. And while he's in Tijuana, he spies a beautiful woman, as many men who go down to Tijuana do. And so there he is, and she catches his eye, this Philistine woman, and he decides, this is the girl for me. And he heads back to his parents and he says, this is the one that I want for my wife. And his parents are distraught and they say, is there no woman from among your own tribe that you can choose for your wife? Now, in this situation here, as the Lord has stirred him, it may seem like Samson is going against one of the key commandments to honor your father and mother. But We see a little bit later on here that it was actually the Lord who was stirring him to marry this Philistine woman because he had something in store for the Philistines and basically he wanted Samson to pick a fight with them. And so things begin to get messy. And messy they did get because at that point, he goes down, he's getting ready to marry this woman and along the way he kills a lion And as he sees it a little bit later on, this lion has honey in its mouth. And so he uses that situation to present a riddle to the people that are at the wedding, these men. And he makes a bet and he says, if you can guess my riddle, I'll give you 30 garments of clothing. And so they are stumped by the riddle and they begin to work on his fiance and they threaten her. We're going to burn your father's house down. We're going to burn your entire land if you don't get your husband-to-be to to tell us what the riddle is. And so, finally she breaks, or he breaks, and tells her, and she breaks, and tells them, and he recognizes once they tell him the riddle, what's happened behind the scenes. And so in his anger, he goes out to the next town that's run by the other Philistine king, and he kills 30 men, takes their clothes, and gives them to the neighboring Philistine guys here. And so suddenly, his love for his fiance magically disappears, and he gives his new wife to his best man. Now things are getting heated here, and I'm not going to go into all the specific details of things that went all the way down to the story of Delilah. But there are things like lighting foxes' tails on fire and sending them through uh, wheat fields to burn them. Things like ripping gates off of city walls. Things like getting your hair cut in the worst way and then having your eyes gouged out and being thrown in prison. And that was the climax with Delilah. And here we see Samson sitting in prison. His supposedly wonderful life has now come to a disappointing end. But there are some lessons that we need to learn here before we come to the final lesson of Samson. And as we consider this miraculous birth and the purpose of Samson's life, what are some lessons we can learn during this Advent season while we're waiting? Well, lesson number one is that we learn that when things are going badly, God is behind the scenes working. 
The people of Israel has, had experienced here 40 years of oppression by their enemy, the Philistines. But God was preparing a man to deliver them. Perhaps you're feeling like the Philistines at this very moment, feeling oppressed, feeling like the devil's got you under his thumb. And perhaps this whole virus has got you down. Perhaps it's affected your job, your bank account, your health, or maybe even relationships. And you're wondering, will it ever end? Well, know that God is working behind the scenes, and he will not forsake you. The second lesson we see here is that God's blessings can sometimes feel like a curse. I was talking to one of the leaders up at Elam there, he's on the council, and he and his wife have adopted a number of children, four of them, and they're grown adults now. And as he was telling the story, I could see the pain in his eyes because every single one of his adopted children have turned away from the Lord and are finding themselves in very difficult situations, many of them drugs similar to what their biological parents dealt with. And As I looked at that and the heartache that he and his wife experienced, in the natural, it may seem like he made a mistake as you look in retrospect. But from God's position, he was working things out for his own good. I'm sure Samson's parents wondered from time to time if remaining remaining barren perhaps wouldn't have been better given the situation that their son got them into. But all along, God was using Samson for his own purposes. Remember that God is still sovereign even when things don't look like it from our perspective. And the third and final lesson is that for all of Samson's flaws, he was still counted among the faithful. Earlier, Pastor Joe read uh, from the epistle to the Hebrews, and in that is the hall of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, talking about all these heroes from the past in the Bible who did miraculous things because of their faith. And so, faith is so important, and it was very important in the life of Samson. As you consider all of your own shortcomings, remember that the most important thing is not how well you do it, but rather the faith in God that you have. Because faith is believing in something outside yourself. And faith in the right thing was the major difference between Samson and the Philistines. They had faith in their god Dagon, but Samson had faith in the God of the universe. And even though he was in prison with his eyes gouged out and probably felt like he had let his family and his nation down, God still came through in the end and used him to kill 3,000 of the main leaders of the Philistines, starting a major war and freedom for the Israelites at that point. And so even though sometimes your life may not look like you thought it would, God is coming through for you And he is going to continue to do his work in you and through you. And so, Father God, we thank you so much for this story of this miraculous birth and the lessons that it teaches us. I pray that you would encourage us through it today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.